Peter Rotondo, the big news with the Breeders' Cup this year is that you're going Hollywood. Now, you guys were here at Santa Anita Park last year, but now you're settling in, right? That's it. We're settling in. We were, yeah, last year, this year, and next year. We'll all be at uh, Santa Anita first weekend in November. We're back November 1st and 2nd um, with the Breeders' Cup. Two days of amazing races, $27 million in purses we give away over the two days, 14 races. Um, and it's at Santa Anita, which is the most beautiful track they could possibly be with those San Gabriel Mountains in the backdrop, as the backdrop. And also, the, uh, the show is going <clears throat> Hollywood in a way, too, right? Last year was the first time that NBC broadcasted it in prime time. And as, if you to as you've told me in the past, this is the only horse race broadcast in prime time. So this is now becoming an event on TV, right? Completely. And especially when we're in, in Southern California within the backyard of NBC Entertainment. Um, yeah, we made it. We, we came back to NBC uh, last year. It was our first year back after the first 20 years or so with NBC. And um, they, they're 100% they're behind it uh, to make that one hour, that Breeders' Cup Classic, which is our biggest race. It's a $5 million race. Best horses in the world uh, run in it. Full field of horses going for, you know, basically whoever wins, especially this year, will be Horse of the Year. Um, and of course, a lot of money at stake in the future with, with the breeding, but it's that it's that one hour on the prime time from eight eight to nine uh, Eastern on the second. Okay, so to so explain the, uh, the 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 difference between this race and the other races, like the Kentucky Derby and the rest of it, and how this really is in a way the the Super Bowl of horse racing, because this is global. This is all courses. This is it, right? This is it. I mean, the, the Breeders' Cup itself goes to over 130 countries around the world. But how it's different from the Triple Crown, which is the Kentucky Derby, the Preakness, and the Belmont, is those races are only for three-year-old horses. So you only have one shot in your career to run in those races. You have to be ready to run the first Saturday in May to run the Kentucky Derby. Um, and only, again, only for three-year-olds, where the Breeders' Cup is 14 different races over two days, all different distances, grass, dirt, Phillies, the girls, the boys, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, older horses, um, and again, all different distances. You go from a sprinter going six furlongs to we have a race called the Marathon. It's a mile and three quarters. So it is sort of the Super Bowl slash Olympics of horse racing where you have all these different uh, heats, so to speak, and the horses, again, they do. They fly in from all over the world. We'll have horses this year from Argentina, Ireland, France, England, uh, Brazil, and they'll all get on planes um, about a week before, and they'll come on out. And how much money are they coming here to win? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It is, yeah, two days, in just the two days, $27 million uh, we give away. So uh, it's a lot of money. I mean, rel if you look at, again, and there's 14 races. So our biggest, the classic, which we're talking about, it's in prime time, is $5 million. Um, you know, compared to other races, it's the richest race in North America. There's only uh, a couple of races in existence that are even more than that. They have one in Dubai that's 10 million. Um, but this is uh, again, it's it, it's just so rich, not just in the money, but in the betting, because there'll be over 150 million dollars bet over the two days. Okay, now set up this year's race for us, because last year we had a, we had Fort Larned that won in a rather dramatic race, and he's back to defend the championship this year, right? But he's not necessarily the favorite, or is he? Well, no, he's not the favorite. Which is something really unique this year is that, uh, as of today, there's five horses that ran in last year's Classic are coming back to run in this year's, which is kind of unheard of. Usually, at that, after the Classic, you might have a horse continue on like and run next year or maybe the year after. But to have five of them all be back the next year to run in the same race... It's never happened before, I don't believe, ever, in the, in the Classic. So we have Fort Larned. He, he won last year. We have Mucho Macho Man. He ran second last year. He just ran a huge race at Santa Anita in his prep race with Gary Stevens, who, of course, came out of retirement. He was also an actor. He was in Seabiscuit. Um, and he, right now, Mucho Macho Man is in tremendous shape. Fort Larned won his last race at Churchill Downs. And then we have Game On Dude, who's owned by Joe Torrey, He's the favorite. He was the favorite last year in the Classic, but had a bad break out of the gate, like got off slowly, and then sort of never got into it. So he'll be the favorite, and you'll have the first two finishers, like the first three finishers as well, uh, in the Classic. We have a horse named Ron the Greek, who just won at Belmont last week at 20-1. to 1. He won by six lengths uh, in a million-dollar race. 
So uh, the best, it's going to be so competitive. I mean, really, really competitive this year. All right, now let's talk about this this idea of pacing because you like to say pace makes the race, right? What's the strategy? If you're if you're a, a jockey here, do you want to go fast out of the gate or do you want to hold back a little bit and then surge ahead of the other guys later? Well, in the classic, again, this year the pace could be really hot, right? I mean, game on, dude, is a speed horse. He goes right to the lead and tries to go wire to wire. So so does uh, Fort Larned. That's how he won last year. He went, he went right to the lead and went wire to wire. Game on Dude was supposed to be on the lead last year, but he got off bad. So the break sort of, you know, mattered a lot. But when I say pace makes the race, it's because if the pace is fast early and horses are, like, dueling on the lead next to each other, a horse from the back is going to have an advantage. There's no doubt about it. It's just the way it is. If one of those horses gets free on the lead by himself, they get brave, right? They're just – they're out there. They're enjoying themselves. And they keep going sometimes, um, and especially if you have a great jockey, which uh, Game On Dude has Mike Smith, who is the best jockey in the history of the Breeders' Cup. He's won more races and more money than anybody else. Uh, he could slow it down a little bit and then go take them wire to wire. But ultimately, the break of the race is going to determine a lot here, and I think ultimately when we see the field, the final field, which will come you know, in a couple of weeks, we'll know the pace scenario. But as of today, it's really going to be really fast. So I'm looking for a closer. Okay, so what's the best advice to idiots like me who don't know a lot about this but want to wager, want to get involved, want to cheer on these horses? I imagine what you don't do is pick the horse uh, with, whose jockey's got the nicest color or the name. Or, or the, the name. That's what I used to do as a kid when my grandpa would take me to the track. Is, oh, I like that name, Grandpa. Put a buck on this. That's, not, that's what it, not to do. What should you really do if you're – following this as a participant, putting money down at the window? Well, first off, you got to do your homework, right? So the, the place to start for me always is the daily racing form. So you go to drf.com. There's all these articles and there's all this information on all the horses that you need to know. And if you're really, if you're a fan, if you're a hardcore handicapper, of course you read the past performances. Some people, if you've never picked it up before, it looks like hieroglyphics. If no one is, can't understand it. So they, they teach you on that website how to read them, right? And I'm not, you know, not going to say you're going to read them and learn them overnight. But if you, um, if you read the articles, you'll get to know the horses. And then there's videos, and you'll see their previous races. And then you'll see their workouts. Remember, leading into the race, just like any athlete, you know, they train. And sometimes, you know, when you're training, you're in better shape for certain races than others. So you have to keep up on it and always check back. Because, you know, one day they could feel good, and one day – and maybe they're not so good. So you have to you have to keep up with it. But really, it all starts at the daily racing form. That's where you get all your information, and then ultimately, it's a puzzle. And once they draw that field, and that'll be later in October, the last week in October, when they draw the field, then you could see how the puzzle is going to be put together, and then make your selection. But that's where to start. Do start doing your homework, gathering some some facts about the the classic. That's what I would do. Okay. So if we look back now at all of the Breeders' Cup races uh, to date. Is there such a thing as the greatest Breeders' Cup race ever? Well, this is our 30th running this year, right? So we're celebrating our, our 30th running of the Breeders' Cup. So we've been looking back at the, at the greatest moments in history, and there are so many. Um, just whether it be a great moment um, of, let's say, a great storyline where we had a, re a jockey that came out of retirement, from England that came and won on a horse named Royal Academy. His name was Lester Pickett. or well, the first female jockey to ever win, Julie Crone, against the boys in, 19, in 2003. Those are, like, great moments. Now, the greatest race slash moment, I believe, yes, I believe there is one. It was the 2009 Classic when Zenyatta, who was undefeated, Philly, never lost before, would always come from dead last, break out of the gate, drop back to last, and sweep and get up in the last two jumps every time. It was the most amazing horse you've ever seen. And before the race, she would do a dance. She would actually put on a show in the post parade. The fans would go wild. She's got more Facebook fans than, uh, <laughs> than some of these celebrities out there. Trust me. It's insane. So you got to Google her up, YouTube, and look up Zenyatta's races. But in 2009 Classic, she ran against the boys, which, again, the girls get, don't run against the boys that often. And when they do, it's a big deal. And especially in the Classic. No Philly had ever won the Classic against the boys. Long story short, she came from dead last. You have to watch the race. And she weaved her way through. The announcer thought Trevor Denman said, well, she's beat. You know, he's, she's going to have to be a super horse to win is what he actually said. 
And she got up, and the last two jumps, the whole <laughs> place at Santa Anita shook, like literally was shaking. Everyone was rooting for her, which was awesome because that rarely happens, right? Everyone has an opinion, but everyone was kind of rooting for her to win um, that day, and she did it in the most dramatic fashion. So to me, the 2009 Breeders' Cup Classic by far was um, the greatest race slash moment in Breeders' Cup history. And there's a follow-up to this, right? She came back the next year, right? Tell that That's story. Right. She did. So she retired her, and they retired her. Jerry Moss, the founder of A&M Records, who's such a great guy, gentleman, um, just a total pro and class act. He said, you know, I could retire her, put her on the farm. Um, she's done enough. But the fans loved her. I mean, she has fan clubs, and they would send her letters and mail, and she was tweeting. Obviously not the horse. Someone was tweeting for her. But <laughs> they, it was, so it got crazy. Um, so they brought her back out of retirement, and she won all the rest of her races until she got to the Breeders' Cup at Churchill Downs under the lights at night, and she, again, dropped back against the boys, dropped back 25 lengths behind the field. Like, looked like she was not even in the race. Like, something was wrong, and everyone was like, oh, no, what's happening? And all of a sudden made this move, and she made such a dramatic run, she just missed at the wire. And what everybody believes is that she was kind of smart, right? She knew where the finish line was because she'd always just get there, and I think maybe she gave herself a little too much to do. She had never been at Churchill Downs, and she missed by a nose. I mean, it was unbelievable. But that's so exciting. Obviously, you would say that's the greatest race, I guess, because we had such buildup. But, of course, she didn't win, so you know that's why I go back to 2009. But, again, 2009 Classic, 2010, you'll never find races so exciting um, as those two. And Zenyatta was a lot, had a lot to do with it. All right. Well, Peter, thanks. We're going to uh, pick this up as we get closer to the race, and we know exactly what the field is like, and we're going to have you help us handicap it. I hope you're game for that. Oh, I'm up for that, for sure. Game on, dude. We'll look for him, too. All right, thanks a lot, Peter. All right, Tom, thanks.